morning. Hey. So, 10 years ago, a bank was a, a bank branch where I went to see and chat with them. And if I had said 10 years ago that in the future you're going to have a, a robot talking back to you over text message and having attitude, attitude yeah. people would have called me crazy. So have we kind of arrived in the future now? Tell me about Clio and... Yeah. So Clio is a digital assistant that sits on top of all of your bank accounts. Um, we've always focused on building a better banking experience than rebuilding a bank. Um, and so far, it's really working. It's been two years. We've grown to 750,000 users. Uh, we operate in the UK, the States, and Canada. Um, and we really focus on making money simple, easy, effortless, um, which is just something not the retail banks have never done or never really focused on. So tell me, how does it work? Like, why, why should I be chatting to a robot? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's a little weird. I always say uh, we want to get to 100 million daily active users that have a habitual relationship with Clio. And it's an odd thing to say to have a, a relationship with an AI. But there's hundreds of thousands of people talking to Clio every single day. Um, if you connect your bank account to Clio, she'll categorize your spending, you know, be proactive, help you save money. Um, the big thing for us is being really intelligent and proactive, which no banking app has ever done before. Every, every banking app you go to, it's just your balance, your transactions, and not a lot else. For Clio, we're trying to be intelligent, personable. We have a tone of voice and a personality with this AI. And that's really resonated with the market. It's, uh, it's grown kind of incredibly quickly in such a short space of time, which is, which is pretty fun. And who are the kind of people who are using Clio? Like, should I tell my mom to use Clio, or should I tell my daughter to use Clio, yeah. or both? Uh, about two years ago, I tried to get my mom to sign up to Clio. She wouldn't even sign up. So it's definitely not your mom. Um, our average audience, uh, average kind of user is uh, 27, median salary is 26K a year, mid-month balance is like 44 pounds, which is kind of incredible to say. Um, and 42% of our users have overdraft fees every single month, which is, which is insane. This is very much a millennial kind of mainstream product. Um, and yeah, that's been our focus ever since we started. OK, cool. Um, so kind of covered the basics of Clio. Let's, uh, let's focus the talk to talk about kind of growth yeah. and fundraising, you know, two topics which probably are close to heart for every, for every founder. You know, I know from my experience, these have been the things which have been keeping me up at night for, for many, many years. But um, before we go into that, uh, let's kind of zoom out. Why, why are you building Clio? Like, you, know, you, could, you could have a great job at a bank. You, know, you could work for another company. Like, you know, why go through all this pain of building a business? Yeah, um, I was really lucky to study machine learning and computer science. I came out of uni and worked at, at Wonga, a fintech, as data scientist. And it was really there that I was like, it wasn't Wonga that was broken, but it was retail banking as a whole. If you look at all the data in retail banking, there's so many customers getting screwed with overdraft fees, FX charges, credit card after credit card. Um, and the bank is there not to help them, but to push more products onto them. So I thought they had to be someone that did something better. Um, and secondly, it was personal experience, probably a lot like TransferWise. Um, I was going into my overdraft every month, earning a good salary. That was really annoying me and pissing me off. So I built, I, I just built a script that would log into my banking and push proactive advice to me that helped me manage my money. Um, and it changed how I thought. And as soon as I got it out there, I knew that there was a product that would serve the market. Um, so for me, it's always been a mission to help people not get ripped off by the bank, which I think plays very similarly to TransferWise as well. Like, what was it from you that, why did you go from Skype, where you did a lot of money, you did really well, you directed your strategy to doing it all again? Like, you must have. That was, I mean, for, uh, for me and for my co-founder, Christo, it was really f seeing, seeing ourselves that, you know, the way banks are doing it is incredibly screwed up and yeah. a very bad experience. And in parallel, thinking of like, after Skype, I felt that it would be really hard to go and get a job. You know, kind of. Yeah. I spent seven years of my life building Skype from an idea on the back of a napkin, and a napkin until a few hundred million customers. And you know, at one point, I felt okay. Like, it's been a great journey at Skype, but if I don't leave now, I'm probably going to be stuck here forever. You know, yeah. life was good. Uh, I left Skype without having a plan of what to do, and then we were kind of uh, started chatting about this money transfer issue that we've seen, and it fit very well with what I wanted to do, as in, 
you know, we made the world smaller with Skype. Uh, and after that, you really want to work on something which has impact. So seeing that we can do something which helps hundreds of millions of people, that was pretty, pretty cool for me. And seeing, kind of learning how broken the financial system was, uh, yeah. it was in a way, then it was kind of a no-brainer to get started. Yet, you know, once you get started, it's pretty damn hard. Like, I remember the moment that so when I left Skype, we were signing up like a few hundred thousand people every day. Yeah. And then launching TransferWise, in the first months we had maybe, I remember, we had 96 users <laughs> after a month. That was kind of depressing. <laughs> Um, okay, so kind of, let's talk about the growth side. You, you've mentioned that today Cleo has 750,000 users. That's a pretty cool number. Yeah. Can you help me put it in context? Yeah. Um, well, we're signing up 100,000 new customers who connect to bank every single month now, which, uh, going back two years when I was just starting out in Clio, was a yeah, far cry from that. Um, comparing to our competitors, we'll probably be beating Monzo uh, in the next couple of months. We're, we're growing, I think, faster than any other fintech, which is pretty cool to say um, after such a short period of time. And I think the reason we've been able to do that is because we've not focused on building you know, the financial infrastructure, the hard stuff, the regulation. We've really focused on being the interface for financial services uh, and doing that globally. Like from day one, we always had a global mindset, and that was actually much influenced by you and Nicholas, who came in very early. Um, that ambition to be a global platform has always been there, and launching in the US spurred a mass amount of growth for us, which was great. Um, you know, and I think the only reason we've had success so far is we've been incredibly focused on the products, and we've really we've worked hard on it every single day. We've not got distracted, which is pretty easy to do being a startup founder. I mean, it is, uh, it is pretty amazing. 750,000 users in two years. It's definitely head over TransferWise was back then. So I do think you might, you might have the right to claim fastest growing fintech company ever. <laughs> That's, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, let's go from you know, when you built a script for yourself. Yeah. How did that become what Cleo is now, kind of a product market fit and, yeah. uh, and all of that stuff, which is that's a hard part. You know, I, yeah. can, I can tell from my experience, you know, it, it kind of in a way it feels it was easy. It was never easy. Like we, we launched a very scrappy product, the, yeah. the classic MVP. And then it took us a while to learn from that. You know, we, we called it peer-to-peer -peer foreign exchange. I don't even know what that means. You know, we kind of, <laughs> after launching, we were looking at how customers talk about it. And we quick, then we started realizing that you know, we're talking about money transfer, sending money. You know, our competition is banks. Like, in yeah. UK, you have many brokers doing, doing similar things. You know, we kind of, in the beginning, didn't quite know are we competing with them. But then we kind of realized that banks is a competition. Uh, talking to customers, we realized what our product pillars are. It's really simple. It's about being cheap. It's about being fast, yeah. easy to use. And then we've been prioritizing everything we do kind of around these pillars. Yeah. So tell me, how has it been for, for you? Yeah, it was interesting actually talking about it last night and how you kind of knew from day one that saving people money and making it simple and fast was there. Uh, for us, it was a little bit more kind of roundabout. I spent the first three months of Clio building an app that absolutely no one wanted. Um, had loads of graphs. As a data scientist, I really liked it. Um, no one else did. Um, so I eventually got to this idea that it has to be simple. It has to be super simple. It has to be fun. It has to be friendly. Um, and I got to this idea of what if I could just you know, text clear? What if I could just send an emoji, get my balance back? And it started there. It was uh, emoji banking, which sounds pretty lame. Um, but that had real product market fit. And I got a, a video demo on the landing page. And as soon as I got that out there to people, there was thousands of people signing up to the waiting list. And every month after, it's just grown 20 30%. And it's been one of these, it's been, it's been hard to build it, but it's been easy because there's been demand and there's been, like, it's just resonated with the market. And there's always the cliched VC thing of, you know, you kind of know it when you see it. And I think you really do. Once you, like, hit on that problem, you almost feel it as a company, um, which, which is cool. But, uh, yeah, a lot of hard work as well. I mean, if we look, if we, uh, look at the metrics, I kind of mm. fully agree. Months on months growth beats everything else. But yeah. what else have you been measuring? So yeah. like, we were big believers in net NPS at TransferWise. Like, we've actually never taken a look at retention. You know, maybe because uh, you know we we believe in our product and we know that people really they have nowhere to churn. 
So we've, we've never paid attention to retention. The cohort curves look incredibly similar since the beginning. Yeah. But NPS has been our northern star. And uh, you know, we've been using NPS to measure different markets. You know, we kind of know things are well if the NPS hits 50, 60. You know, we were, I was incredibly proud last week when there was a, a study from YouGov. And they, uh, they had done an independent study on most recommended brands in the UK. Yeah. And TransferWise came out on top of it with an NPS of 83. You know, wow. we, we, we haven't even shared our NPS numbers a lot publicly. Yeah. But, you know, having, uh, having YouGov say that TransferWise NPS is 83, which is the highest yeah. in the UK, is pretty cool and kind of a testament to, to what we've been doing. But what's, what's it been for you? That's incredible, like an 83 NPS. Uh, I think that's like Apple, Tesla kind of numbers, which is insane. Uh, we're definitely not quite there yet. We're about 60. Um, for us, we've always focused on engagement and retention. It's been, if you look at the space, no one has ever been able to crack that by building the interface. So people have tried savings apps, and they've tried, um, tried to build banks and cards. For us, we really focused on retention and engagement for day one. And I'll say for any startups in the audience, that is the most important thing to get right. There's no point thinking about distribution or growth until you have retention curves that asymptote above zero at some point. That is the, you know, the classical definition of product market fit. So I think what we did really well from the early days was being maniacal on pushing that up every single cohort, um, thinking, what do we do next? What's next? Asking our customers, focusing on that. Um, it's, the, it's the most important thing for any consumer startup. Fix your attention, fix your engagement. Um, the distribution can come later. You can raise a, a lot of VC capital and do a lot of marketing, but it's really goddamn hard to build a great product that people love. And you know, I think that's what drives us at Clear every single day. And has that kind of led you to prioritize certain features, deprioritize? Like, what's the most engaging message that <laughs> Clear can send? You know? Yeah. yeah I, I personally still like uh, Cleo telling me that I got I got my paycheck. But you know, what's the What's it for yeah. the population at large? Yeah, it's been, a, it's been very different from other services. It's a very proactive service. Most apps you go into kind of passively. Clio comes to you, she talks to you, she helps you. Um, and we do some really interesting and odd experimentation with it. We have a game on a Saturday where people can win uh, 200 quid if they answer questions about their money. And you'd probably be very surprised in the audience that anyone would do that. But we have 150,000 people playing that game every single week. Um, it's, it's a little bit odd. It's a little bit bizarre. But um, we've just constantly experimented and done what our users have told us to. It's never been a, any kind of visionary product genius. It's always been, what are our customers telling us? What are we going to build next? How do we do that as quick as possible? And if you focus on that and you keep that cycle time really low, you'll end up building a great product. Do you see any difference between geographic markets? So, I mean, mm. I know that US growth is going kind of gangbusters, but kind of, is there anything you can generalize that UK is different to US? I, th I thought they would be. When we launched in the US, I thought it'd be radically different, different tone of voice, different everything. It's surprising that if you go to every single kind of Western market, retail banking is very much the same and broken in all the same ways as well. So. It's the same problems that we're serving for customers in America, as in Canada, and now France, Germany, Spain, Australia. We're going to Singapore, Hong Kong next. They're the same fundamental issues that the big four banks in each of these geographies push onto their customers. And for us, that's helping people save money, giving them control, giving them back some power. Um, yeah, back on you. Like, have you found any differences, or has it been? I mean, surprisingly, not that much. You know, yeah. like, wherever we go, we're in more than 40 countries. It's uh, it's the same story of banks overcharging customers, underserving them. Yeah. Kind of surprising that there is not that much difference. Like I was last week, I was in Sydney, and in Australia, there are four banks. It's like a stranglehold of the market by four banks who are amongst the most profitable of anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. and there's no innovation coming from these people. It's amazingly ridiculous. You go to Japan, very similar. You know, we. Uh, we launched in Brazil a couple of years ago. Yeah. You know, surprisingly, the product as we had it in the beginning, like we weren't proud of it. I would say it was an MVP. But the growth in Brazil was absolutely ridiculous. And what it came down to was that the banks were even worse. Yeah. So even a product which in the UK probably wouldn't have moved much was incredibly successful in Brazil just because the competition was so, so poor. It's there's so much opportunity in retail banking. There is such a big market to address. And there's, 
there's basically untapped opportunity to build multi hundred billion dollar companies. And I, I really do think in five years there'll be multi hundred billion dollar companies. Transferwise will definitely be one. It's the growth is insane. Um, but you know what I get really excited about is building a new kind of financial services, one that works for the customer that doesn't rip them off. It's actually there to be helpful. Um, and you know, maybe there'll be a trillion dollar company in the next five years. I really hope they will be. But there's a yeah, there's just a huge opportunity, which is exciting. What are what are some of the other things you've done for growth? So at Transferwise, we we uh, we spent quite a lot of effort on PR in the beginning, just kind of talking about the problem, educating the market. You know, I think it's probably somewhat special to us because people did not quite know they are being uh, screwed so badly by the bank. So yeah. we had to do, and we're continuing to do lots of education. Like you know, at times, I was doing one press interview a day, which was you know, quite a big chunk of my time that went for it. You know, I, I, and maybe the, the one geographical difference here is that when we launched in 2011, you know, bank bashing was a really hot topic and we had tons of fun. Yeah. That actually surprisingly seemed to be quite uh, UK-centric. Like when we moved to US a couple of years later, the bank bashing topics actually did not resonate that much. Like what, what's... Any, anything, are you doing much on press? Like, what are the gross channels? Yeah, we've, um, I've been so focused on, I think most people should do this as well. Um, it's a little bit of a different story. I've been incredibly focused on building the products and making that really work. You know, I think fundamentally, press can be fleeting. Um, and in the very early days, until you have revenue and you have growth, um, I wouldn't, you know, I would actually advise not to spend a lot of time talking to the press. I would advise, spending a bunch of time making the product as good as possible. And when it's working, that's when you should probably come to Slush and speak on stage with Tavit. Um, but until you've got that, like, just build a goddamn product. Um, and it's also what your strengths are, right? You were the director of strategy at Skype. You literally built Skype from the first employee. Um, I was a computer scientist. I was much better suited to building a product. So I think you should definitely play to your strengths as well. Um, yeah, I'm probably going to have to do a bit more press in the future, but so far it's been word of mouth. It has been, been really good at experimentation and being good at paid. Um, it's, uh, distribution's just a lot about experimentation. There's no kind of silver bullet for getting a lot of users. It's about trying a bunch of different things over and over and over again until you can drive down your CPA. And hopefully your MPS gets so good that people will organically refer it. Um, and we're definitely at that tipping point now. So we have a 60 MPS, and it is growing every single month. Um, but yeah, it's goddamn hard. It's, uh, even when you have a product market fit, it's hard. I mean, word of mouth is by yeah. far the biggest channel for TransferWise now. And yeah. I remember it was, uh, it was uh, a Swedish guy, Henrik, who was working on our, on our growth probably 2013. Yeah. And like getting to the, seeing a graph that, you know, we looked at kind of how many people get referred by people based on their, uh, based on their MPS score. Mm -hmm. and it was a very simple correlation, you know, kind of obvious, but you know, people who have an NPS give you an answer of 10, invite three times more people than the people who give you an NPS answer of five, so pretty simple. Um, let's switch to, to fundraising. Mm. So you've, I mean, you've had a pretty easy time fundraising. You've raised <laughs> $13 million so far, kind of. Yeah. What's, uh, what's, a, what's the story behind a successful fundraise? Yeah. How do you create that FOMO and uh, how do you get the storm going in a... Yeah, I think you're the master of this, so I'll let you talk more on it. But uh, I think the most fundamental thing for any fundraising, there's no tricks or tips. It is just put a good graph on, on the board. If you put numbers on the board every single month and you keep delivering, it becomes very easy to fundraise. It uh, becomes very easy to hire. The business moves faster. If you can just focus on growth and focus on building a good product, it, it makes everything much easier. So, for example, our Series A fundraise, I sent an email to two VCs um, and had a term sheet in two and a half weeks. Didn't have to waste time or energy fundraising, which is probably the most precious thing as a startup founder. Um, I'd actually you know, advise not to spend a lot of headspace thinking about fundraising. Um, but it, you know, some, of the, some of the things I think we did quite well is we always had kind of engineered inflection points in the business as we went to raise. So for the last round, we'd just launched in the US. The numbers were going mental sent an email to some investors, and it's like, oh, of course we'll put money in. Um, it's probably the easiest thing you do as a startup founder, but I don't know, you, you literally raised 200, 300 million now, maybe more. Um, what's been... So actually, surprisingly, like you, you talk about um, 
inflection points for every mm -hmm. round. Like, I say, for us, the story has usually been more of the same. Like, if I, if I think back, back, you know, okay, seed is a little bit different. Yeah. I mean, even actually, we launched our seeds. The product had been live for eight months, uh, so we could show some numbers. Uh, you know, we could show repeat usage, but. Since then, you know, A, B, C, D, it's pretty much been more of the same. Like, you know, going into our Series A, we're showing, you know, we're growing probably 15x year over year. Yeah. It becomes a pretty easy story. Like, you know, go at our C round, we're probably growing uh, 4x a year. So that, that really kind of helps you get uh, gets, uh, competitive tension happening in the market, which allows you to uh, to complete a successful fundraise you know it's i agree with you not to spend much time on it yet you know for us it kind of ended up being uh, typically end of the year yeah. the yearly process of fundraising which it still does take up you know probably more time than it should but uh, but i guess that's uh, that's life 100 percent. i came from an accelerator entrepreneur first and it was it's interesting seeing the cohorts coming after and coming for advice you really notice who's going to fundraise very, very quickly. The ones that are successful at it are just so maniacal and so they're just going to get it done. They're going to get it done that week. They're going to push investors to make it happen. And then the people that you see kind of, yeah, maybe we'll do this, maybe we'll do that, they'll kind of meander about a bit. They put some deadlines on it, get all those meetings in one week, just, just crank it out and force the, uh, yeah, force the deal here. And, um, it's very easy to kind of spend six months fundraising and doing lots of pitching. It's kind of fun to a degree, but I would just like, biggest bit of advice, make it happen quickly, don't spend too much headspace on it, minimize the time that you fundraise, so you can get back to talking to users and building a product, which, you know, in the end, it's the only thing that really matters. Excellent, so I think with that, we're done. So cool. thank you very much, and hopefully so. in 10 years' time, we're all gonna have an, an, an angry, AI-powered assistant <laughs> talking at us from our phone. 100%. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, dude. Here you go.